Those are like cough drops, aren't they? So, and we, I don't even know what all the rest of them are. That looks like some kind of macrophage or macrophage, however you're supposed to say that. And I feel like that guy yesterday was so quirky and weird. I think he was probably a doctoral student. Doing, getting credit for, for doing this video thing, but I mean, this and that, and all that. But it was really smart, and I, I start looking at that thing, and, and I, it was, I had just read it back over all that chapter, um, and it was like everything he said was, was you know, from the book. Why did y'all see anything that was not, you know, not, not accurate? I think he's just, uh, you know, he's really good, but he's very, very quirky. But, um, but anyway, I, I, I think that that's a, a great, great um, introduction. I think it was such a good thing that he um, he pointed out the big either that the macrophage and the macrophage that that means you know the PHD that that has to do with, with eating and, and macro means big so big eater that just makes a lot a lot of sense and um, the neutrophils are eaters too but they're just not as big and they don't live as long and stuff so they're they're not the big eaters they're, they're the they they're the first on the scene but but they they just don't. Um, uh, eat as much. They, they, the neutrophils die once they um, end up eating something, and, and or they just don't, they don't live uh, very long at all, and uh, um, some, can, can eat lots of things before they die. So okay, they can live months in the tissue. I think I've got that later on. I'm jumping ahead, but anyway, um, I don't think I had anything on that notes page. Did I have anything on the house? No, I don't know. I just forgot myself a note and I didn't have one. Okay, most of this is stuff that y'all already, already know, and I'm not going to do this. I'm going to spend a whole bunch of time because a lot of these things will be that, that, that fellow just ran through it yesterday. And y'all people who come certainly get that um, from, from the um, decline academy. But um, the function of the immune system to protect the body from foreign antigens and identify and destroy potentially harmful cells including the harmful self cells the like he was talking about the the mercy killing when when the um when a cell was was um inhabited by by a viral dna and was was just uh pouring out the, the virus and then it puts this this uh signal out saying please please kill me because i don't want to kill the all the rest of the cells around me in my, my environment and all that kind of thing i thought that was a really cool way to describe it um so so uh the, it, it, Lights itself up in a way for the um, immune cells to, to eat it, and it, it's sort of like a—it's um, not committing suicide, but it's like asking for the hitman to come after you or something like that. So, and then removing the cellular debris, like dead or damaged cells, or, or um, the cells that have like exploded. If there was a lysis of cells, um, then, then uh, you would have to—the immune system helps to remove that. Okay, and then we we know what an antigen is, and I think that's really cool about the antigen antibody generator. That really you know, makes a whole bunch of sense. I've never heard it said like that before, but, but I mean, I, I knew that that's what it did, but I never realized that that's where the word came from. So anyway, we've got our two two kinds of, um, of immunity. Well, um, is the antibody mediated and the cell mediated adaptive um, immunity, and then um, the immune system distinguishes between the self and the non-self. And um, he, I don't think he, he may have mentioned this because he, he went so fast, but the human leukocyte antigens are on the, the surface of all body cells and every single person has a unique kind of fingerprint, it's, it's like a fingerprint, and, and less, unless you have an identical sibling or identical siblings, um, and there's nobody else that has the same uh, cellular um, HLA, the human leukocyte antigen is the, the signal that it's um, or the, the uh, marker that identifies you and that, that it's your signal. So um, anyway, that's just a, a, a really, really cool kind of thing too. But that's how they decide um, which which organs can be transplanted from person to person is HLA. Um, if you have an HLA match, that's that's really important for, for that type of thing too. So okay, we're on the way here. Come on, all right. So, um, the um, and Jennifer just showed me her little her little diagram thing. She's got this this square. And she's got immunocompetence and hypersensitivity, autoimmune, and and um, or um, and and immunodeficiency. So um, those are kind of the four the four components um, of the of immunity. 
and then the understanding the immune system. This actually is, I know when Ms. Mimbertlo taught this, um, I had shown her this, and I kept, in this slide, I kept thinking, what is she talking about teaching clients and families? It, it's that thing from the NIH website, and it is um, on the, the website information. It is just really, really cool. That they used to give it out um, if you call NIH, I think it's like 1-800-4-Cancer uh, or something like that. that. That's part of the National Institute. It's a pill for National Cancer Institute. And so you can just call them up and they send you the most recent edition of the book, Understanding Cancer. But now it's online, and so you, you can get it online. It's got great, great slides. And I'm showing you a few of them in the cancer unit, like the naming of the cancers and, and stuff like that. It was it was from that, that particular website. But understanding the immune system is really, really, really good if you have to delve into it um, deeper than what we're, we're getting. Uh, and, and some of the stuff is not too deep either. You might want to just flip through it if you have any um, good questions about things because it's just really great. I used to study that when I had to take the exams for my certification for oncology nurse. They let us do just clinical practice and, um, and, and um, professional development now, but I had to take the exam three times before they decided to, to, uh, to change it to the other way. You can still take the exam if you want to, but that's a great, great way to prepare for the exam. You really need to understand the immune system to, to, really, to be a cancer nurse, so, or at least on that certain level. So um, uh, I'll let y'all look at the, um, at the definitions on the, the uh, footnotes page, because that's, that's pretty much something that we, we all, um, uh, let's keep, my thumb just doesn't, doesn't do this right here. Um, and I've got, I'm still having trouble texting on my phone. It's my phone's not new anymore, and I'm just I'm all the time. Okay, so we got our playlist deals on doing the sites. Um, and don't be bothered by these different numbers, different ranges. If you might have 4,000 to 10,500, you might have 4,000 to 11,000, you know, so being in the ballpark, you know, if it's below 4,000, that's probably not so great. But if it's above 11,000, that's probably not so great. And, but look at look at the um, the way that the, the machines calibrated whatever facility that you're working in, and and see because if it's over 10,500, um, it might be you uh, know uh, tagged as high. But um, but the, in, as far as you don't have to, we're not going to get anything so fine tuned that it's not going to be same ballpark as whatever you're seeing in, in different sources. Um, and just know that when you have too many white blood cells, it's called glucocytosis. And then if, it's, uh, if you have too few, then we have, that is called what? Glucopenia. So, and that would be less than 4,500 by this scale, but we used to, um, we're trying to decide when people were going to be able to take their chemotherapy when they had their white blood cells checked. We would let them take it if it was over 3,000 at one point, and then we started doing absolute neutrophil count. That was a whole, whole different um, deal. So that brings us to. I'm so sorry. Here we go. Um, no, that's not really good. I think I went too far. We have we have several um, that are that are title types of leukocytes because there's there's so many of them. They keep finding more. Okay, that's the one. Remember that all the components of the white blood cell differential add up to 100%. Um, and that's, that's not something that y'all may have paid a whole lot of attention to, but um, the granulocytes, and you're going to see all kinds. I saw 55 to 70 percent, and I saw 50 to 70, and I, you know, so there again, it's, it's just that, just know that the granulocytes are the greatest percentage, and they're over 50 percent usually. Um, uh, but if they're over 80 percent, that may mean that there's a, a big infection or something like that. that. So it's not really normal to have way too many either. Um, so it may be... Um, blotting out in the bone marrow, they, they may not be letting the, the red blood cells and platelets um, uh, be forming in, in there with, if they're doing a whole bunch of granulocytes. So anyway, the, we'll look at some of the myeloid stem cell thing. We did that a little bit with the cancer unit. 
Um, and uh, the granulocytes are part of the inflammatory response, and uh, they're like the sentinels of the, of the immune system, the, the very first sentinels anyway. And it's like that, that guy said yesterday, they don't care what they, what they eat. Neutrophils don't care what they eat. If they, they just go in there and, and, and eat it, if it doesn't look like it's supposed to be there, then they, then they get it. So that if they, unless there's something wrong with the process. So, um, we got neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils are all granulocytes. Why are they called granulocytes? There's granules in the yes, in the cytoplasm of the, of the cell. Exactly. So, um, and then the, the neutrophils we've already learned that are they're phagocytic. And I, I just I can't remember which book I got what this what source it was, but there it said there were a hundred billion neutrophils released daily from the bone marrow into the into the bloodstream. Um, if everything's working normally with that, if the person is immunocompetent, then that the, the hundred billion, now they don't have to remember that, it's just a cool fact to know and share sort of thing. But it, you know that's a that's a lot. Hundred billion. So the bands are the immature ones and they, they make up, up about five percent of the leukocytes. Um, and I I guess I think I'm gonna um, see if that if I can find one of those other slides that's got the picture of it. Okay. It's not really not really showing the bands. I know we got we've got one that does, but the, the neutrophils um, it says that they it has kind of a um, that they're they're segmented. You can see if you I don't know if you can see it from here, but on if you can see it on your your screen when you look on your computer, there's there's little little segments of kind of globs there that are that are segmented, um, and uh, they they have uh, the nuclei are multilobular, and you can you can just kind of kind of see. So these do have the white cells do have nuclei, the red blood cells do not, but the, these lobules there's multiple ones, and that's why they they call them um, segmented. Um, or they can call it poly, polymorphonucleosites or whatever. So the poly just means there's, there's several, um, several shapes in, in, inside the cell. So, and that's what morphology is, it's what does it look like um, and, and how is it shaped. So um, some, some hospitals or labs will call it segmented neutrophils and some will call it the polys. So that, that's the same thing. They're, they're the, the immature cells that do um, go the next step is to be a, a, um, a mature neutrophil. So now if they've got the blast cells, the myeloblast, if there's blast cells, that's, those are totally unfunctional. But the, uh, the, um, the other, um, the, some of the banded neutrophils are able to, to uh, phagocyte, they, 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 they're able to eat other stuff. <laughs> Whatever. The phagocytosis is something that, that some of the banded ones can do, but, um, but if you have a whole bunch of banded ones, it's very, very in, inefficient um, phagocytosis. And some of the bands cannot perform phagocytosis. So, so you're, you're not really do, doing a whole lot of good if you have a whole bunch of, of bands in, in your blood. So it takes about 10 days for the neutrophils to mature in the bone marrow. But if, if you take um, like the, um, oh, I, that may be one of the things I was going to tell you. Um, <clears throat> the, those um, um, growth factors, the granulocyte stimulating factor, G, or GCSF, granulocyte colony stimulating factor. That was in that, that quiz thing. That article was not as detailed as is the article that uh, I had had in previous years, but it was getting older, and it was like five years old or so, and so I, I got this, this new one. It had some good information in it too, but it really wasn't in, in as great a detail. And I did have it on my slide that that if you take the GCSF, or really any of the growth factors, if you take erythropoietin, sometimes you can have bone pain because it's, they're churning out so many that have not been released into the bloodstream yet. But when we talk about that you're supposed to to have like a hundred billion every every day uh, released from the bone marrow. That's a lot, a lot of churning going on. And then if you give granulocyte colony stimulating factor um, uh, to try to beef it up, um, then then you may have even even more of those being produced in the bone marrow at one time. And then it makes it makes the um, the bones hurt because your your bones are not going anywhere. You know they 
they're they're not they're not going to give um, when the mare is so full, and so it does cause severe bone pain to, to the degree sometimes that people have to take narcotics, have to take opioids to relieve the pain. A lot of times, anti-inflammatories will work really well, but that's what a lot of people. I, I did throw that one out on the exam because I thought I really had used that as a, that question because I knew that, that y'all had read the article, but then I thought, you know what, that article really didn't say it, I don't believe. Did it, was, it do y'all remember it saying that in the, the bone pain? But it was on the slide, but the, there were so many slides and that was, you know, that was not a, that, but that, I just want you to know that if any of these growth factors, but especially the, um, the granulocyte colony stimulating factor can cause severe <laughs> bone pain. And it, it's mainly where the bone marrow is. You know where you've got more bone marrow in in your body? So, like a, where they do bone marrow tests? They they may do it in the sternum and the, and the head. Yeah, the iliac is the, the the best one, especially to do a biopsy. Like a, a bone marrow biopsy is best in the um, in the hip. But you can do just a uh, just a, a bone marrow aspiration from from the. It looks like they're they're killing a vampire when they do it in the chest. It's so awful. The first time I saw it, I just felt fainting because that it's just like you're stabbing them in the heart or something. But it's just going down into the bone, boring down. But um, but anyway, bone pain is is going to be more likely. And some people think they're having a heart attack, and and so you you may have to rule the heart attack out. But if that if they if the enzymes are not not high, then you know, you have to, and they've had Nupagen or uh, New Lasta, the granulocyte, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, and you you, um, you can maybe um, expect that that's the reason, is that they're hurting right here. They say it feels like a, something's just sitting on their chest really hard or, or sometimes like a stabbing pain, and then and hurting their hips. And the long bones of your, the, the beginning of your long bones of your arms and legs, like, like about down here, I think I have a little thing I can pass around that I can go find at my drawer at break to show you where a lot of the bone marrow is. But like part, partly down your humerus and then and your femur. Femurs are especially up in the, the hip joint and everything. It's very vascular, but there's a lot of bone marrow in, in here too. So people will hurt in their, um, in their legs or sometimes even their knees is sort of a referred pain because the way that the spinal nerves are kind of twisted up together um, at the, in the bottom of the spinal cord there. What do you call it? That cauda equina, like the horse tail, where all the nerves that can kind of touch each other and send signals the wrong way. A lot of times, if you have something wrong with your hip, you'll hurt in your knee. Have you ever heard of that before? That that's that's happened to me before. I had bursitis in my hip one time, and and it was hurt. My knee was hurt. I thought something was wrong with my knee, but it was the bursitis in my hip. So. Um, but uh, but that's I've heard lots of people say say that when they they're having hip trouble that that their that their knee hurts. So. Anyway, that's kind of a diversion, but, but I, that was one thing I meant to tell y'all yesterday about the, um, the bone pain thing, that, that that's just something y'all just didn't, didn't connect with for some reason on, on there, so we get there about one now. Um, okay, so we, we have um, the, the eosinophils are, um, are, are granulocytes too. You can see granules in, in that cytoplasm, but um, there, there's only a few of those that circulate at any one time. Um, but they, they only circulate, the half-life is 30 minutes, so that means it's about an hour that they, they circulate. But they, they can go into the tissues, and that, they last longer in the tissues, about 12 days. You don't have to remember that so fine-tuned or whatever. That's just sort of interesting to know. But, but um, what you really, really need to know is that um, it, they are phagocytes. They can, they can eat up um, what's not supposed to be there, but they're not very efficient at it, like the neutrophils are. And they do protect your respiratory and GI tract from like parasites, like worms. Um, and then it, the big thing to remember here, because our exemplar, our first exemplar is going to be hypersensitivity, and that's a big deal. Remember that EOs have to do with hypersensitivity. So that, that's your biggie. And then your basophils are granulocytic, but they cannot do phagocytosis. They, they don't do that at all. But um, the, the, gran, the granules, the granulocytes, you know, the granules in here, um, release uh, bradykine and serotonin, leukotrienes, heparin and histamine, all of those can be mediators of inflammation. Um, the one that we're, we're most familiar with is what? The histamines, the one you think about in allergic reactions. But, um, and I, I think we talked about this, this before with the, um, you know, how come you get a dry cough when, when you take an ACE inhibitor? And which, which one of those is, is, um, is involved? 
the Brady Conan. Yeah, the Brady Conan. It, it, there's more free Brady Conan um, when when um, when you block the conversion of angiotensin one to angiotensin two, and so that's that's why it causes some inflammation that that causes a, a, a dry cough, and that's why you can have what kind of edema can you have with with um, uh, well, you can have them with beta blockers and with um, with ACE inhibitors. What's, what's the other one that you can, you can have? What kind of edema? Pulmonary. Well, pulmonary with beta blockers in particular, but but um, but you actually you can have some angioedema with with um, ACE and and with um, uh, uh, beta blockers somewhat too. So, but uh, but anyway, that that's that's the reason for it, and I, that is just so cool. I, and I told you, I just I just learned that about about six weeks ago. <laughs> you know, as I asked Miss Rumble, and she she had had um, been working in that that field a, a whole lot with um, um, uh, cardiac patients and everything. So. Okay, so so this is um, these are released during a hypersensitivity or stress response. So that's um, they, they, those mediators of inflammation are released from those basophilic granules. But the EOs are are, um, are very very critical in the in the inflammatory process um, also or the hypersensitivity. In the All right, so um, the. Uh, Okay, antigen presenting cells, APCs, they, they recognize the, the foreign matter and initiate the immune response. They're actively phagocytic. Um, so that's, a, that's the monocytes, macrophages, and the dendritic cells. And some of that, all three of those perform some of the same functions. It's just there that they do just different times, and there may be more of some of the others at different times that your kind of immune system cycle, whatever's going on in your body, if you've had an infection or, or um, you haven't had an infection lately. Or, They're they're not very many of those in the um, if you're looking at the differential, it's just a few percent of those normally, and they circulate one to two days, then attach to the tissues for they can they can stay in the tissues for months to years, and that's where we get our big eaters. They those develop when they're um when they're actually in the bloodstream, they're called monocytes, but when they go into the tissues, they call, they're called macrophages. So. Um, and they, they, um, they're called histiocytes in the nectar tissue, they're called for cells in the liver, so they, they look different in, in different kinds of tissue. They mature in a different way, but they still do a phagocytosis. It's just the characteristic of the cells that they're trying to protect. Um, and I think that picture that they did on the, um, the first little video wasn't quite as riveting, but when, when they were drawing that picture of the immune cells that are outside in the tissues, and then those are, are sucked back into those lymphatic um, uh, uh, channels, and then it goes through the, the lymph nodes, and that and that filters out all of that junk and all the stuff that the macrophages have have um, taken in, and uh, and then then it goes clean back into the bloodstream, so that we don't have all that junk going in our blood. So I thought that was a really really good depiction and illustration of that. I'm able to just look at that again. Sometimes just a, just a refresher of your mind because uh, it, it hit me. I just maybe have a better picture of what's going on. Um, and uh, it is especially active. The, the, the macrophages, monocytes are with um, TB and viral infections and parasitic infections. So they have a and they do have a longer lifespan than neutrophils, obviously. So um, the 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 neutrophils are, are produced just really, really, really frequently, but they, they die real quickly too. And they're very, very neutrophils are very, very sensitive to chemotherapy and radiation therapy and, and also um, and the, the bone marrow, um, the part of the bone marrow that, that makes the neutrophils is very sensitive to to chemotherapy. And that's why we, we look at neutrophils and, and uh, before we give cancer treatment now, not just the total number of white blood cells like we used to do. We look at the absolute neutrophils. So, and then the dendritic cells, he talked about that. They've been sort of star shaped and they, um, they, they can be in, in my or in lymphoid cell lines, but they, they um, alert the lymphocytes to <coughs> the presence of the injury or infection and then they activate the helper and killer T cells. And all of this is not.
significant to what we're talking about with our exemplars, but we got to introduce it somewhere. And so, that, so I'm, that's why I'm doing some of this stuff. It's not really going to have specifically to do with, with what we're talking about. All right. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to get back to my, my picture. There we go. And, um, and there is a figure in, in Iggy, too, on page 305, figure 19-3, that has more detail on here. But again, this, this is just how the myeloid line, these are the, the, the blood stem cells that can become any kind of blood cell. They can't become other things, but, um, but they, can, they can become any kind of blood cell depending on what signals are, uh, the body sends to, to uh, for what, what's need, what needs to be produced at that particular time. So the myeloid contains the... The uh, EOS neutrophils, uh, basophils, that's like the, the white blood cells. Myelocytes, that's another way. Leukocytes are myelocytes. And then monoblasts do the monocytes and the macrophages. And see how they're shaped differently. They're not, they're not all circular. Um, they're, they, they become other shapes and everything in different tissues. And then the lymphoid, um, lymphoblast, lymphocytes, and plasma cells, that, that's like um, antibodies. And then our, um, this, all of this... Um, comes the me megakaryoblasts and thrombocytes or platelets and then the erythroblasts and, and the RBCs. And, and we, we had looked at some of that stuff um, before, but that's just a, another reminder of how, how it all comes about. There we go. No? Okay, we need to do our lymphocytes. Yeah, that's right. I keep getting mixed up because it, it's titled the same thing. I probably need to change the title so I don't get free on the same side again. Okay, so our lymphocytes. They're um, 20 to 40 percent of the circulating the disease, and they, they constantly circulate and they go to the lymphatic tissues of the church and memory cells, and that's our acquired immunity or our um, adaptive immunity, either one. Either one of those A words is, is appropriate to, to use for, for that adaptive or so the T cells, and he showed, he told us that yesterday, they mature in the thymus gland, that's why they call them T cells. They're not, they're made in the bone marrow, but they mature in the thymus. And then that's integral to the specific immune response. And then the B cells um, mature in the bone marrow, and that's what he said, B for bone marrow. Um, and uh, it's integral to the specific immune response, which is the, the antibodies. And the natural killer cells are the, the other kind of, of um, lymphocytes and they are in the spleen and the lymph nodes, bone marrow blood and um, that's another one of the surveillance. We've got lots and lots and lots of surveillance going on in our bodies. That's, that's what's so awesome about teaching this unit. It's like I've studied this stuff before but it just when, I'm, when I've been teaching it it's like gosh this is just such an amazing thing. All these things that our, that our body does and we're learning more and more and more about this immune system and and just like what, what the guy was saying yesterday, it sounded like he was being real fluent saying the biology's all about about sex and not dying. And that, you know, really most species, what they're after is to, to reproduce so that they can continue the species. So that's where the sex part comes in, because he, he's a true biologist. And I know my daughter um, majored in biology in college and and she um, and botany was her, her fun thing, and that's what she got her master's in. But she said one of her test questions was uh, what is the purpose of flowers? And the answer was sex. <laughs> so yeah, they, they just they just got the, the sex oh, yeah. it's all out for everybody to see. That's what we're looking at. This flower, you know, all those all those sex organs are just right there for the uh, pollination. They have the bees and the birds and all that. That's why we call the birds and the bees. That's the sex. So, and then the not dying is is that we are able to live in an environment with all kinds of. of um, nasty things trying to trying to get to us and trying to kill us so that they can survive and so we're we've got um, uh, this tremendous immune system that that allows us to survive and when those kinds of things are not working properly then then we don't survive so well or we um, we may be very much weakened at least so anyway um the natural killer cells can can get into the the um, the, the, the dangerous self cells like the ones that have the germs in them and, and all that too. So natural killer. That's the one he said that 1973 kind of gave it this sort of a lame name, but at least it, it tells you what it's doing. It's not something strange like, a, like somebody's name, Rachmaninoff cell or something like that. That, that would be kind of, kind of 
kind of dumb. It just tells you exactly. All right, this is a real, real, real important picture because you're going to, people used to have a problem conceptualizing this, looking at that sort of linear up and down kind of thing about how how the, the leukocytes mature. Here we got the stem cell. This must have been just like the standard way that when they first learned about how this, how this, the leukocytes reproduced and all the different precursor cells, um, starting with the stem cell, they, they, they had this kind of, kind of diagram and all the doctors and all the scientists used this diagram and it went from left to right. And so that's why this is so important to, to have in here. We've got the stem cell that's committed to, to the myeloid line. So we got the blast, the promyelocyte, metamyelocyte, banded neutrophil. Here's a good one where it, it does um, have a place where it's going to sort of split off into this, this um, segmented neutrophil. So that that's, gives you that, that idea. But the mature is on the right. The immature is on the left. So doctors and scientists and, and everybody that studies immunology and all, they say if, if, you, if you start having problems to where, where you've got lots, lots and lots and lots of bands, um, you know, like 75% bands or something like that, and you start going, going down in, into these other lines, especially if it goes down to blast, that's, that's very immature, isn't it? You can see that, that it's, it's, blast is very, very, very immature. When you see blast, that means that there's, there's a, a likelihood that there's leukemia, especially if you've got a real high percentage of blast. So, but sometimes um, in, with infections and, and um, other, other problems, if, if, even if it's just bands, and um, and it's not the not the normal amount of bands. There's too many bands that are that, that are more than what, what's considered normal um, on the machine that your hospital uses. Um, you're calling it a shift to the left. If it's any of these, if like if you if you don't have that 60 to 80 or 50 to 70 percent um, of the mature ones, then there's a, there's the rest of them. If there's more of the other than than there are of these, or more than they're supposed to be of any of these, some of the you shouldn't have any of these in here. And, and when things are normal, you'll have a few bands. But it is called a shift to the left, and that's this gives you the picture of why they call it that. Because I didn't know that for the longest time. I knew what it was. I knew it meant immature, but I didn't understand why they called it left. But so it does not mean liberal and conservative or anything like that. But but uh, anyway, that's that's something that people were missing on NCLEX and missing on um, Kaplan tests and all that. So that's why I'm making a big deal about that. So you've got to remember that. It goes left, right, um, and right is mature. And so I guess you could say right being mature is correct. So that that makes it out. Also have there's a lot of extreme sepsis in your body can't the bone marrow can't keep up with the the, um, the demand then you may not um, not be able to, to have enough mature ones coming out there that just the demand is so great that it's spitting out more more bands so and and possibly some other immature ones as well and I'm gonna let y'all um, look at this is something that the vertebro did um, you know that just sort of a chart and then it's not necessarily just to memorize all of the half-lives and all that kind of stuff, but but um, just realize that these just don't, these could be produced really, really quickly, especially if the body is demanding it because of an infection or because you've had a, a granule site colony stimulating factor or, or colony stimulating factor. Um, and here this one says 55 to 70. It's like, you know, you're going to see it in a whole bunch of different places. But but anyway, just realize that this, these are the most, these are the next, and then these other ones are just, just a, a few. And you don't have to memorize the exact number, um, except I, I would the neutrophils in particular, to, or at least have, have a, an idea of between 50 and 80%. Um, but I would like you to know what, what they do, though, um, the part on the right. I think that's the... That's the most important part of this chart. So, um, and it, you don't really have to memorize um, all of those things that are on the on the notes page. There are a whole lot of lists and everything um, about about what they do. But if you if you have an idea of what they what they do in on that that right column in this this chart, you should be you should be good on that. Okay, and then there's some tables of EU that I've. Alright. 
Okay, and this is just a, a neat figure. This came from a Pearson um, concept book where the, the bone marrow, that this is the, the um, lymphatic line. We have natural killer cells in the lymph nodes in the spleen and the other lymphoid tissue, and that's supposed to be spleen there. There's our thymus that's behind our breastbone. And then the B cells are in the um, bursa tissues and, and probably the bone marrow too. And then this this is telling us where where they where they kind of come from. With the ones that mature in the thymus, the um, helper and suppressor T cells, or CD4 and CD8. And that's more important when you're studying the HIV. And then the cytotoxic T cells. Um, and then the that's a type of CD8 cell. And then the production of the IgA, IgD, IgE, IgG, IgM. Those are all the different kinds of um, antibodies that are that are called plasma cells. The B cells turn into either plasma or memory cells to remember and, and, and have the maintain the immunity. Um, and then the plasma cells actually produce those, those antibodies when the memory cells are awakened. And then you find out that. Um, uh, that, that the body needs more antibodies produced to um, to fight something that you have been exposed to before, and that it doesn't take you as long to produce once you um, have been exposed to it one one time. The first time you produce antibodies is a slower process, but the second time um, and, and subsequent times it's going to be um, much quicker. Okay, and we know what antigens are, but the and antibody generators they provide a specific What's the that's not compatible. Um, vaccines, pollen, egg white, animal dander, insects, fire, snake venom, transplanted tissues, um, just or, or all kinds of foods like peanuts and stuff like that too. They just have one, one uh, example in one of the sources and I'll put a few more in there. Um, and um, the antigen determinant site epitope, that's, that's really um, kind of like the identifier so that so that you can go through your files and say, oh yeah, we've seen that before. That's the identifier. Mm -hmm. I never have really used that word that I mentioned that's the problem with the that's the problem with the that's just what it's called. Um, but anyway, um, the, the B cell is the, the humoral, is how he said it, humoral. But that means, you know, like he said, I, I never really thought about that either. I knew that it was like the, the general all over the body response, but it, it was in the humors, you know, like the blood and the lymph fluid and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's in body fluids is what they're talking about. So uh, so it, it's in the bloodstream and that's part of the humoral, humoral, whatever. That's why they used to, to bleed people that thinking that the, the bad humors were uh, what caused them the illness and all. Thinking about the George Washington. Okay, and then our antibodies can be in lots of places. It can be in our bloodstream and other body fluids and then in, in the tissues as well. Um, and uh, the B lymphocytes start to produce antibodies to react specifically to that antigen, and then that's called the primary exposure. It's the very first time you've been exposed to that epitope of that particular antigen. Um, and then the, um, later when, when that same antigen um, Appears like a, if you, you're having the same like a, like strep throat or something like that, and, and you've been exposed to that before um, uh, with the, the same type of bacteria and all that, then then um, the memory cells are going to say, wait a minute, we've seen this before. Um, uh, we got to go go through our files and to find it, and and, uh, and then it, it doesn't take that all long. It takes three days at least with the first exposure in those cases, but with the second exposure, you can start responding within 24 hours. Bacteria or the virus? 
can directly go to your temperature center in your brain and, and tell your brain to make your temperature go up. Well, it, it's really your, your immune system's causing that. It, it's your own body's fight against those organisms. That, and I'm not, I'm being very non specific with this, but it, it really is our, all our immune systems fight against the organisms that, that um, is, is uh, causing us to feel bad. It's not the organism itself, but the organism out in us, we can get that in the course, but that's <coughs> the, the, the deeper and everything is meant to be part of a, a whole process. And the aging is maybe that our blood cells are trying to, to rev up and, and uh, come to the rescue. And, uh, so anyway, it's not really the antigen itself, it's our body's response to the antigen that makes us feel bad. Okay. This, um, this was from that Pearson book, too. I just was trying to get, get my sources on some of that stuff because I know y'all can't look it up unless you have a copy of that. But, but um, this is just giving you a, a diagram of the antigen-presenting cell and the, the, the phagocytosis that's going to go on and then the helper T cells come in, the killer T cells um, start directly attacking um, the, the cells with the antigen in it, but at the same time that the hum humoral or humoral response is going on, we've got, got um, B cells and they turn into plasma cells and they, they produce antibodies that directly and specifically um, destroy those, those particular antigens. And um, sometimes though, um, I, this, is, this is sort of a simplification when you're saying that it's only going to go for that antigen because have you ever, um, like, say, taken a flu shot and, and you get the flu, but what about, I, I just know, I just feel like maybe this is not true, but that there is a little crossover immunity sometimes with other viruses because um, a lot of times when I've had a flu shot and then somebody else is not, and then they, it's not, they don't have the flu, but they have something that's really contagious and a lot of these other people around you are getting it, and then and you don't get it. I, mean, I just feel like the so sometimes that we do have a little bit of crossover that it may there may be some of those antigen presenting cells or the antigen is very similar and it can can hook up and, and attack. The reason I think that too is that that um, we had we had a patient a long time ago that that went he, he had prostate cancer I think it was and he had taken all the standard therapy and there there are a lot more standard therapies now than there were you know, 20 or 25 years ago when this was. But um, he went to a place in like Tennessee where they were experimenting with all these biologic therapies um, to try to just directly produce antibodies against the, the cancer cells. And so he went and took that and it was against adenocarcinoma um, and so that, that attacks glandular um, uh, cells that are cancerous. Well, what happened was the, the treatment actually, was, and it was a new kind of a response to sort of thing, is what it's trying to do is get the immune system to kill it. Well, it, it actually killed a lot of the cells along his GI tract, his lower GI tract, his colon. He ended up having this tremendous colitis and, mm. and just diarrhea, diarrhea, and dehydration and all that. And it didn't kill him, but it really made him really, really <coughs> sick. So, so even though they tried to, to have that antigen antibody response specifically for the, the prostate cancer cells, the, the immune cells recognize <laughs> the colon cells as, and that's kind of what goes, goes hyper in our... RA and our lupus and all that too. So, but that's just kind of an observation from a long time ago that kind of makes me think. Well, I know there's got to be crossover. It's not. It's not always perfect, but it's going to be. It may be something similar. We we'll recognize the, the real antigen that, that um, the memory cell is, is um, able to respond to, but it also um, it may attack some other ones. And sometimes that can be a good thing. Like I said, with like with the flu or with um, having some crossover with fighting for the viruses. So let's do let's do a ten minute break and then we'll we'll come back. <laughs> We're glad to see everybody that is in their seat today. I'm so glad to have all of y'all. All right, antibodies. That's the the main thing in our humor which is the 
inventory. This is this That's what we're getting at. Okay. The classes of the antibodies. IgG, IgA, IgEno, IgD, IgE. And they probably crown them even more. There, there's probably probably lots of other things going on that we, we may not even be aware of yet. But wasn't in your book anyway. So um, the, the pathogens activate the T lymphocytes and the helper T cells start the universal ones that they get the antibodies going. So IgG, I do want you to know that it is a major one and it's, it's uh, makes up about 75% of the antibodies that, that um, circulate in the blood. Um, and it, it's against viruses and bacteria. And it actually is the one that, that majorly passes through the placenta to the that's how the, the, um, the fetus gets the immunity. And um, it's, it's um, lower and stronger than other immune bodies in response to the, the bacteria and the viruses. So that's on your notes page. But, and then the IgA, remember that that one is, is more in, in the secretions, um, in the, the respiratory GI, uh, genitourinary tears and saliva. Um, so that's that's where where that's that's mainly working. Um, it protects your mucous membranes. Isn't it interesting that that guy said that that that's really considered the outside of us? That I heard something about that. We're, we're really just a oh I know it's it's a, it's a book called Gulp by um, Mary Roach. It's about the GI tract, um, the alimentary canal, the interest in the alimentary canal. They said that, that some scientists said that we're we're just a we're just a GI tract with all this other stuff around us to, to feed our GI tract. <laughs> you know, that we walk, we, that we have our brains to be able to find food for our GI tract. So, I don't know, that's, that's a theory, but it's kind of interesting that he said that that's really part of our outside because um, none, of the, none of the GI tract is sterile, is it? And then the respiratory is um, not, not really either, not an upper part, but it's especially the GI tract, we, we um, are not so worried about having organisms in there as we are in areas that are supposed to be sterile or not part of that. So anyway, the, the IgA is what protects um, those areas. And IgM is for the primary immunity that um, uh, is produced in 48 to 72 hours. And I don't think so 30 days, that will be 72. Two to three days it takes for the, for the primary immunity. Um, and it's, it, it protects the uh, body from rheumatoid factors and gram negative organisms in you know, the ABO blood group if, you're, if you've got the wrong match to for blood transfusion. Or if it's um, if it's a, a fetus and a, and a mother. I just read something recently that that they're finding that there's a lot more connection between the baby's blood and the mother's blood than they thought. They thought the placenta was kind of the barrier um, and that that, that that it wasn't supposed to share back and forth, but they're finding that there's there is more there's more cellular exchange between the mother cells and the baby cells, and that they're really studying that that it can have some potential, some good potential, but and they have to understand that there's those reactions and everything too. It's very much of an infancy. They're just you know suggesting that, and it's like well, we'll see we'll see what, what comes of that. But anyway, um, the IgM does not pass through the placenta, but that's the first antibody that, that uh, or immunoglobulin that the that the, the uh, child starts to produce on its own. So it's produced early in life, and then the levels increase greatly after uh, nine months of age. Um, but the the IgG does does not um, form quite as, as early. So that's one reason why. Um, uh, Children are susceptible to certain cancers, or that they're susceptible to certain kinds of um, infections more so than, than older children and adults would be. And so, what's, what's another way? Um, what's a way that, that the massage through the placenta umbilical cord? What's another way that that uh, the the baby can borrow antibodies? Breastfeeding, exactly, exactly. So, so that's another way that that um, you can protect your, your uh, baby is, is to, to breastfeed, and that, that doesn't work out for everybody, but it is that is another way that they can get IgG um, while they're producing their their um, IgM. They'll have some IgG as well. So um, they don't really.
really know, maybe they do know now about the IGD, but I'm not going to worry about that. There is one, though. And then um, the IGD, <coughs> I do want you to know that it has um, to do with allergic responses and the hypersensitivity and anaphylaxis. So I do want you to know that because that's going to Cytokines carry the messages for immune system function. Um, that's one, one thing that, you know, granule site colony st stimulating factor, colony stimulating factor, um, lipopolitan, all, all those things are telling the immune system what to do to some degree too. So in some categorization, those are considered cytokines. Also, there's all kinds of communicators telling, um, you know, they're not cells themselves, but they're, they're chemicals that help along this process, the inflammatory process and the, and the um, specific um, adaptive immunity. So, um, and um, I'll let y'all read about those other, other T cells and all that sort of thing. But that, but they, that does somewhat have to do with um, RA and, and all that as well. But the regulator, helper, suppressor, balance, in between, balance between the helper and the suppressor T cells is, is really, really key as to whether we have a, we are immunocompetent or whether we are are hyper hyper immune like with the RA and the lupus, which is what we're going to be studying. So, um, and when you're talking about the vector, the cytotoxic or killer T cells, they're called vector cells. That means they're getting out of business and doing something. <laughs> it's effective in the sense of we're helping a change, we're doing something to what happened. All right, now this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this page is. The notes page is just wacko busy, so I, I don't want you to memorize that necessarily, but it, it is in your book pretty much. It's not exactly the same words, but very, very, very similar. So it's just, I would like for you to read through that about the complexity of the process. It's really, really, really complex. And so it, it's, that's what's so awesome that, that our body can do all these things. It's like, how in the world? Ever imagine that we still have the scratch surface of our body to do and our brain. I think that's, that's, that's one of the, uh, the frontiers that we're right after. We maybe we'll talk about space to do frontiers, blah, blah, blah. But the <coughs> frontier is the brain right now. We don't really have any idea what our brain does, too. So, so um, our brain has the function that for some of these things to work, too. But anyway, the, it, the seven steps to the producing the, the antibody. And again, you don't have to memorize that, but it's just to, to that's that's something that if, if you at least have read about it and then, then you see what happens with RA and, and, um, and lupus and hypersensitivity and all, you can kind of understand what's happening um, more. Um, it's not, not something that I'm going to say, describe this process from the beginning or anything like that. So don't, don't worry, because I know you look at that and go, oh my gosh, what is she going to do? Okay, lymphoid <coughs> system. The helpers of protein is what that's your system. And it's all that neat illustration this day is about how it does recover. Because all of the stuff from the tissue, um, the, the proteins that the body can recycle and, and, and use again, and you need to go to the, the bloodstream, the, the liquid 
fluids, the fluids and everything. You got edema and you've got you're taking Lasix or something, um, then uh, that, that's where that, that fluid from the tissues is going to go in through the lymphatic system and then go into the, um, you know, through the ducts and, and back into the bloodstream and all that. So that, that's really pretty, pretty, pretty cool. And um, I'm not going to go into all this, what the spleen does and all that, but it is just one of the things that is part of the lymphatic system. And I am going to have, it's not an exemplar in the, the cancer, you know, the, the rest of the cellular unit, but leukemia is, and leukemia and lymphoma are, can be very, very related sometimes, so we are, I'm going to have you read about lymphoma anyway, so I think it will help you to, to understand uh, more about this lymphatic thing, so that's the reason I showed you that particular one yesterday. and died of a so awful. Um, I was working like um, um, PRN when I was in grad school and I was right before Christmas. And he was from around here too, but he was, he was a dude. But he had a thymectomy for the, the um, myasthenia virus. And that's what he had all the muscle weakness and all this sort of thing. And he had aspiration precautions. And so um, his wife had left and said, And then, and because of the CPR, and he had just had chest surgery, it was it was not a pretty thing. So it was awful. So that's that's one of my bad version stories. What could you have done different if somebody just didn't didn't pay attention to their aspiration precautions? Lymphoid system, but um, but anyway, the, sometimes we can live without some of those. You can live without a thymus gland, actually, but but it does affect your your immunity. So they the uh, T cells would not be um, maturing as, as well. They can sometimes the nodules can take over um, some of that, that process too. Just like we said, if you don't have a spleen, your your lymphoid system does um, compensate to some degree. And this comes from that. Um, uh, understanding the immune system. You can see down here it says National Cancer Institute, and, and this is a really cool thing. This just gives you a rundown of all the all the lymphatic um, areas, and and, um, and so we got our got lymphatic vessels. They, you know, when they were drawing that picture, they didn't have them in the chest. There's lymphatic channels all in the chest. I mean, it's there's just loads of them in the chest. It's like when somebody has lung cancer, it's so hard not to have it it's like in the center of the chest, um, like small cell lung cancer. It's just, I mean, the, the nodes just really go for that. And, and so that it's, it's real easy for it to, to spread if it's, if it's right there. So anyway, um, I'll let y'all um, read over that part because that's just kind of an anatomy physiology sort of thing, but that's a review. So. All right, now we'll go to our non-specific inflammatory response with the, the, I know this jumps around, but it, it's like when we're using our, our other our two books, they, they kind of jump around too. So and then this is how our, our, our whole concept of this, so we introduce the, the, uh, the concept, and then, then it gives you some, some details. So, so our non-specific, we talked about that. 
that in, in one eleven with the inflammatory that we have the barriers like this, our skin and our mucous membranes and that some of our processes like like urinating um, can help clear out the, the urethra and keep germs from going and getting up into the kidneys and causing pyelonephritis and and um, bactericidal substances and body fluids. We we talked about prostatic fluid being protected for, for men against um, urinary tract infections. Um, but if there's if those barriers are, are breached, then we can have a process going on. And that's one thing that I just know that he was, he was, he said, they don't care what they attack, they just attack the same way every time, and that's what the non specific process is. <coughs> one thing that um, you really do need to know, I probably should tell you this, but something that you really, really need to know is what happens with the inflammatory response. And what are the stages of that inflammatory response? You haven't had it before, but that's something you need to know for this unit too. So just make sure that you, you make a star on here or you make yourself a note that, that this particular slide you need to, to know about the inflammatory response in those stages. So that, you know the vascular cellular, the, the constriction and dilation, the ex exudate and the repair of the phase, and that shouldn't be new to you. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it, it can be live. So, um, and uh, and then the natural passive is, is the mother to child. That's that's a, so. What are the two ways, mother to child? Breastfeeding. People with cancer and HIV and other immune disorders sometimes have to have multiple doses because they're just not producing it up on their own. And that's probably, you know, that's one of the things that when we talked about, well, how much on that can just you remember? Because I'm making it a minute ago because I, I, I know that sometimes when we get up here, I'll forget. Really, just something like a flu shot or something? No, um, it just happened a little bit. She can't have a flu shot anymore. Like, um, like if you sleep on your hand, 
and it wakes up, you know, the tingling. Mm -hmm. thing. So you just have that That's what abnormal. Like. And when some people can't walk, I mean, they're just like paralyzed. Yeah, so weak that they you know the paresis, maybe not paralysis, but the paresis, right. the weakness you can have. She, uh, she couldn't then like squat down and stand back up. She mm -hmm. would squat down and All just fall them. over. Yeah. <laughs> and you could think, well, that that might happen with the blood magnesium or potassium or calcium or something like that. But because that, those kind of things could cause it too. But in this situation, um, I, I haven't studied the really brain that much. I'm sure that you know, quick shot. Um, but you can, um, but it, it, it evidently has a, it has something to do with T cells. That, Viruses, live viruses, conjugated toxoid recombinant. So, be, be familiar with those cons of, of uh, you, can, you can look at the, the toxoids are. I think that's a kind of an interesting thing. The toxin is being treated to meet in the toxic effects, but then it retains its antigenicity and still um, elicits an immune response in the body. Um, and it just weakens it where it's not going to uh, cause a, a tremendous problem. And that may be what, what happened with, with Joey's mom. There may have been some sort of um, they, some some sort of um, immunization type of thing, or maybe an exposure to a virus or something that, that would um, elicit that kind of response where it then um, attacks the, the body's own cells. Oh, I know what started. It was an ear infection. That's what it was. Uh, so it was a virus. this in 111 somewhat too. If you have 
and this, but we, I don't think we said it like this. A, a life-threatening allergic reaction to a vaccine um, and can, can end up being an anaphylactic reaction. And, and what, can, um, what can happen is if you have a low-grade fever, that's not abnormal with a, um, with a vaccination. But if you, if, especially if an adult goes over 104 degrees, that really could be a warning that this is an anaphylactic reaction happening. And it's not a guarantee that it is, but it's, it's very, you gotta be very suspicious that it might be. So that, that's something to be, be really, really um, aware of and to report if you had a really high fever, even if, if nothing, nothing bad happened, report that the last time you had this particular vaccine that you had a high fever because it, it, it might be a real judgment call to, to maybe not take that, that vaccine again because the next one, the next time might be, be what, what goes over the top. So, okay, um, and I'll let y'all look at the, you know, about the Tylenol and what to, what to do about it and, and all that. draw an antibody tighter to see if a booster is needed or if, if the previous immunizations are still working. Um, I imagine that most, most of y'all did, did most of y'all have like chicken pox vaccines and, and uh, not chicken pox. or something like that, then, then you're going to have more more immunity if, if you were actually exposed to the, the disease and had your, uh, uh, such a um, such a violent immune response, you may have you know, probably got probably get exposed to it again, have, uh, turn out lots and lots of antibodies. Probably could uh, draw his blood and lose some of the Okay, and then... Um, And I did talk about this in 111 also, about that um, some people have beliefs that, that they shouldn't have to do um, all of these. And they're, like, I think I told you about in Washington State, where my daughter lives, there's, there was just tremendous um, resurgence of pertussis because, they, because the uh, parents weren't wanting to, to uh, vaccinate their children. And they, there was exposure, and, and it just went through all kinds of communities and lots and lots of... Um, children died. I mean, uh, you know, a lot more than, than where people are vaccinating um, appropriately with, uh, with public health recommendations or CDC recommendations. If they do refuse, then you have to document the, the informed refusal. Like, what did you what did you tell them? You know, you, we can't make decisions for people, but but we do have to to say what to document what teaching we do give them. Make sure that they they have the right information. Um, in order to make a decision, they may not make the decision that you would like for them to make, but at least you've given them information uh, by which to make that decision. So um, I think that they do have a right to refuse, but sometimes that, that does take their right away from being um, in certain public areas and they have to be quarantined and that sort of thing if there is ever an outbreak. So y'all know about Healthy People 2020 also, and then that's that's one of the things that, that they uh, focus on is is in uh, 2010, they wanted to eliminate a whole lot of these um, children's diseases, um, developmental real syndrome, diphtheria, most polio tetanus, and then reduced over and uh, they had all these goals. And I know 
think that we just, we just make all this stuff up about making we're measurable goals and all this sort of thing, but it helps people there are it's very specific. If you want to see it, it's really, really boring to just read it, but um, I did put forth how the goal, how the 2010 goals were met or not met. It's a great big long um, link um, on this notes page, but I clicked on it the other day just to make sure that it still worked, and it's just this on and on and on and on. Well, we did this percentage and then this percentage, and they, and they have they have very specific percentages of people that would would have had or two kids that would have had these particular diseases, and they wanted to reduce it. They made their goal specific, and they wanted to reduce it by this much, you know, the, this percentage. And then if they didn't make that, then goals met or not met, you know, that you have to. That, so that that's not that's an epidemiology thing. And, and um, again, I, I said this to my clinical groups that when we're doing concept maps and we're we're um, writing smart goals and we're evaluating them according to criteria that we set in the goal. That's that's what healthy people does. Um, but but that's our science. That's that's um, what makes us a profession is that we use a scientific method. And then that's our nursing process is our scientific method. And if we don't if we don't use a, a scientific method of practice by using evidence based and, and best practices, um, if if we don't have research results, then then we're not a profession. We're just or just a job, and it doesn't mean we can't do a good job, but, but we are not a profession if we're not, we're not doing things scientifically. That's what's so important that we do this. It's not just busy work, and I know y'all think it is, but it's fine. It really is fine, and it's what makes you professional. So, there's my soap box there. I hate it, too, and I hate breaking up sometimes, too. But we just have to do it. <laughs> we just do. Okay. pretty much talked about some of this. Well, the IgG from the placenta disappears by six to eight months of age. So um, so we do have protection, some some protection from, from the mom. And it's a gradual decrease, too, because the, as the, the child gets older in there, they haven't made their own IgG starting at nine months. You've got a little bit of a gap, and it's, it's weakening as the you know, older they get. And then, then it'll catch up at about uh, or start to about nine months. Um, but uh, they don't have normal values until about 67 years old. So that's why um, some, some children are susceptible to some cancer. And, um, those first years of life, until mm -hmm. so they, so they get uh, the genes from where it needs to be. And uh, they more than just prone to infection because of their, um, their low levels of immune protection, especially for premature. And then the human, the human milk is protected against infection, and that's that's a really, really, really big push for, for um, healthy people. Twenty twenty. Do, do y'all do y'all have a maternal child group? Don't you? Did, did y'all read about breastfeeding or anything? Did any group um, look at that? So, but did, when y'all were reading, did you run across anything about the, the immunity with the breastfeeding or anything with that? That way, that wasn't what you were really focusing on. But I just wondered if that's, but, but that is definitely one of the, one of the issues for, um, for uh, public health 2020, you know, a bag of weight that's going to 2030, I guess. So, and I'm sure they would get it from here to here. Okay. So then we're going to go to the, the older people, and their, their immune function declines with age, and we, we've learned that um, in, in 1.11 too, but this is just a review here. Um, we do have lower resistance to infection and poor, poor response to immunizations. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't have them. And we, we would give our cancer patients flu and pneumonia shots even if they were in active chemotherapy or radiation therapy, um, knowing that they probably wouldn't have as good a response. But for reasons coming up, we can't really stop the therapy just so they can you know, get an immune response. Um, what we try to do is to, if they have like a three week interval between treatments, <coughs> We would give them the, the, the shot at a, at a time where where they wouldn't be as likely to have a, a little black blood cell count um, or production going on. And, and um, hopefully, heads are bent. You don't really know what it's going to be in, inside, but but um, at least if they can have to develop some antibodies, it's better than not having any. So and so, so that's the way with older people too. They need to have their their vaccinations, but they may not respond as well as a young person would. I may not have the fever and chills and stuff that some people would like to have. 
and then their hypersensitivity response can be reduced or before delay. And um, that there is a, a chart in aging without the, um, the, the immune function and changes that are the immune function in the older adults. And that's what you don't say. Inflammation and, and infection. Okay. Um, so our, our alterations are the hyper responsiveness, which is the allergic um, anaphylaxis, autoimmune disorders, and rejection of organs uh, that are that are transplanted. Um, an impaired immune response um, that is is uh, with AIDS and immunodeficiency disorders. And the reason that we do TB, well, why, why do you think we do TB? That's really a respiratory thing. Maybe you can have it in other areas, but it may be a respiratory thing. Anybody see Tombstone? Dr. Holliday? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Tombstone and uh, Wyatt Earp, they came out really close together, and then both of them did. Dennis Clay was, was, uh, was Doc Holliday in one. Who was, who was Doc Holliday in the other one? Val Cameron. Oh, that's right, Val Cameron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, so, so y'all remember him coughing up the blood and all that. But, so, but, but when, when you are immunosuppressed, you know, that if, you know, you notice that, I think about that girlfriend, and, you know, she'd sleep with him and kiss him and all this stuff, and how's she not sick? Why, why do you think maybe she wasn't? Well, she was don't even know it um, and haven't had a TB skin test or anything like that, they, um, they, it will wake back up uh, um, you know, the, the lesions that, that were, were um, dormant, that's the word, they were dormant, and it can wake back up. And, and some people that knew and have been treated for TB and then it, you know, it goes dormant, uh, that, that is something that they have a risk for. Is that what shingles is? <coughs> shingles is chicken pox. I know that, but I mean, like usually people oh, yeah, have yeah. shingles. Oh, you're right. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, yes. And it's because any time that you, you have a, um, if you are suppressed or you're under a lot of stress, but that suppresses your immune, if you're very stressed emotionally or whatever, so it or physically, it can wake it up. Yeah. And the older people get it more often. That's what you're, you're connecting is yeah. that older people are much more susceptible and they can take a vaccination for, for it's herpes zoster, but it's, it's the same, it's actually the same um, organism as the, the varicella. It's the same, it's the same thing. And it's just this dormant line along nerve roots and then you end up getting and I would people get it in their face or get it in their eye. Oh, I had a friend that about died. It's so dangerous. But yeah, that's that's a great example. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, so so that's why. We're, we're studying it in the immune system, though, is because that when you have when you are immunodeficient, um, the the uh, the herpes zoster wakes up, the TB can wake up. There's other things that could too. But yeah, those are that's a really good stuff to bring that up to to um, Ms. Walker and say that you know because I think she's going to bring some. But no, that's a very very good point. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thank <laughs> you. 
A lot of this stuff in here that came from the other book, because and y'all can figure that out because you know the nursing process and all that. But I think it kind of helps to to see what what the problems are and that your, your interventions will will be uh, dealing with nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, all that affects your immunity, um, and then your pharmacologic therapy to, to help restore immune function or or to to uh, get rid of whatever is is causing the immune function to to be um, suppressed if it's a disease process or bacterial infection or something like that and then there there are some um, complementary therapies too um, and then um, we, we can sometimes just use um, NSAIDs, corticosteroids, antibiotics, prophylaxis, immunizations, all those kind of things, and the IV immunoglobulin to provide protection. Now, sometimes people take, um, and when we're talking about the immune globulin um, as the passive um, um, artificial immunity, it came from, it's like you're borrowing it from somebody else, but I mean, of course, you, they can't use it again, but you're taking it, you know, using somebody else's, and then, um, then once it, it loses its effectiveness, you have, you have to do it over again, because it's not something that's causing you to make your own antibodies at all. It's just letting, using somebody else's antibodies to, to uh, prevent infection or to, to treat infection. But um, again, we'll, we'll talk about um, what, what uh, Joey was, was saying when we talk about some hypersensitivity, because I think that's what, what that Gillian Beret, we have to look, so look that up and see, see if that is, is very similar to um, another disease process that we have. Um, here. Okay, this probably, since we, we will talk about that hypersensitivity exemplar then, um, first thing tomorrow, and then we'll start with the RA, and just remember about the, about the PowerPoints that they are dark, and if you want to print them, you know, some of y'all, you don't